Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tell Your Story. I'm your host, Todd Nesloni, and each episode I look to bring you a different guest who has encouraged, inspired, or challenged me in one way or another and bring them on to share some of their story in hopes that it inspires you to tell some of yours. I'm thrilled for this episode to have Kelly Pascarella on with me. Kelly, kind of tell everybody who you are. Hi, Todd. Thanks for having me. I'm so delighted to be here, and I love all your inspiration that you share. Um, I am a mother of two. That's my proudest achievement in life, um, two young boys, but I'm a 15-year public educator. I'm a doctoral student at the moment, so I'm going into my dissertation year coming up, Ooh. and um, I'm a current sixth-grade ELA teacher. Awesome. Well, Kelly, whenever I start these conversations, I always love to start back at the beginning. And that is, you know, when you were a kid, what did you dream you were going to be? And did it does it have anything to do with what you're doing now? <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny because all of the things I dreamed I was going to be have fallen into place now that I'm, you know, in my late 30s. So <laughs> I wanted to, I, teaching was always in the top three. I always kind of had a running list and that top two always changed, but teaching was always up there as well. Um, for the longest time, I wanted to be an architect um, until I was about in, in, in about sixth grade. I drew pictures. I took art classes. I really wanted to design and build. I just thought that was so fascinating. And in sixth grade, I interviewed my teacher's husband who owned an architecture firm in our town. And he actually said to me, you know, girls really have a hard time succeeding in this business. And that totally changed my mindset, you know, this was years ago. So I just, you just know, take for, you know, what you learn and go from there. And I kind of switched my love of art to marketing. And I started shadowing um, some friends, parents who were in the marketing business. And I wanted to do sports marketing because I had always loved um, the sports that I played. And I wanted to bring kind of the art and the excitement of the arena together. Yeah. Um, so I went into college for marketing, but teaching was always right behind it because I was so inspired by certain teachers throughout my life. And I had a conversation with my brother who said, you know, you're such a family person. You love like your family more than anything. You love people. You, you like interacting with people. Like you don't want to go work in the business world, you know, in a city and, and not get to truly have good relationships with people. Yeah. So that made my ultimate decision freshman year in college. And I, um, I had taken classes that fit both marketing and uh -huh. education, you know, all the general eds you have to take. So um, right after freshman year, I decided teaching is definitely where it's at. And I, I decided to go with elementary ed because I'm kind of a generalist. I like everything. And mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to teach all subjects yet, you know, still be creative in my classroom in a way. I love that. And so, you know, so you always were drawn to elementary then when you decided you were going to be a teacher. Yes. And I think my decision was because I liked every subject. I thought it was really hard to choose, you know, and, and only focus on one the whole time. I wanted to be able to switch back and forth. And I, I enjoyed math, yet I enjoyed writing and uh -huh. drawing pictures that went with stories. You know, I, I like a little bit of everything. So that was my decision for elementary ed. I also really like kids at that age. Like mm -hmm. They're so creative and open-minded and, you know, they haven't kind of they're not stuck in, in certain areas yet, you know, and right. you still really mold them with your words and your encouragement and your positivity. Um, just the feedback you give them can help shape them a little more, I think. Well, you know, now that you've been teaching for a few years, what do you think is something you've really learned about yourself that may be unexpected? Oh, I, I've learned that it never, teaching never stays the same. And I think once I've accepted that, I've, I've enjoyed it a lot more. Like it's okay that it changes every year. I remember my friends, when I first started teaching after a year or two, they said, well, you've already done this. Like, don't you just do the same thing every year? And I think it's such a huge misconception about educators is if, if you're doing it right, you're never doing the same thing right. year after year. You know, you have some similar things you might find that are, are worthy to repeat, but you're constantly changing and evolving. And that's um, what I've found a little bit surprising, you know, yeah. it, but also the best part of it is learning about myself that I'm a lifelong learner and you've got to keep rolling forward, you know, keep moving forward. You know, and, and you've also got this thing called is it's elementary blueprint, right? And yeah. so I love first of all, like I I obviously had no idea where the title came from, but mm -hmm. I love hearing about your love of architecture as a kid because to me this seems like there's probably a tie there. And so tell me a little bit about what that is. 
Sure. So um, I, I was out of the classroom for a while. I was in a leadership role. I was a gifted coordinator. Um, so I taught for seven schools. I was in charge of grades K to five, writing gifted education plans for individual students. And when I was traveling among the seven schools, all within the same district, I was helping teachers find resources to enrich their learners in the classroom. Yeah. And what I noticed was every school that I went to, there were so many fabulous educators across all the schools, but everyone was using different resources and mm -hmm. they didn't quite know about some of the other great things that other yeah. people were doing in their same grade level. So I had started about two years ago, um, I had started for the district I was working in, I started enrichment banks. And there were like very organized templates for each grade level with websites, apps, books, um, things that the kids could use who were in need of enrichment in that mm -hmm. grade level. And, and then it would be consistent for every building um, among the seven elementaries. And from there, I thought, well, we shouldn't just do this for enrichment students. What about the English language learners? You know, what about um, the kids who need reading help and what, what materials are they using? Um, even in math or across the board, you know, mm -hmm. for social emotional learning, what type of resources are we offering? And how do we get teachers to be aware of everything that's at their fingertips. Right. Um, what I've found is so many teachers have, um, they want to do well, everyone wants to do well, but the amount of time it takes to keep up with everything that's out there can become very daunting. Yeah. And it takes away from your family time and you know right. the time with your own children. So to be able to come up with a resource that could kind of be the umbrella for everything. Um, and I've, I've, I've put my doctoral research towards all of this. Um, so I'm kind of starting to see some really cool themes emerge and I'd love to share them with you guys. Yeah. So, you know, that's so interesting that, that I, I mean, you're, you're doing so much right now. And I know the one question that people always ask educators who, who have their hands in multiple piles is yeah. how do you balance it all? <laughs> that's a great question. I'm a pretty, I, I like routine. I get up early, I run. Um, that's kind of like my meditation. That's when I listen to podcasts or I listen to or I watch a show if it's in the winter um, or I just listen to something that motivates me for the day. Um, right. It's a nice way to clear your head and kind of get your thoughts organized and attack your day. There's a book called The 5 a.m. Club and I've kind of always been a part of that. Um, growing up, I was a swimmer. So any swimmers out there know that you're in the water, usually at 5 or 5.30 every morning before school and then after school. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's kind of just been ingrained in my DNA to get up early and hit and attack the day. And I think that that time in the morning allows me to kind of plan out the day and, and figure out what's the best use of my time that, you know, once I'm once I've figured out myself, how can I then serve others? You know, if you get yourself right, then you can pour it out to people around you. Exactly. I think, and you made a great point. You know, we don't have anything to pour if we're not taking care of ourselves too. And so, you know, you mentioned how this work with elementary blueprint and with your, with, with the GT things and all the other kind of stuff that ties in with your doctoral work. And so uh, for those who have been through or have any knowledge of that, you know, it's a lot of research and work that goes into that. Yeah. And so what is something really big that you've learned while doing all this work? Yeah, so my, I've learned a couple of favorite things from doing the doctoral research. Um, first is that teachers across the globe are kind of experiencing what we're experiencing, trying to keep up with information and communication technologies. And they're feeling the pressure now that things are more data driven to not only keep up with the technology, but to make it have an impact in their classroom to use that data. And so we're not alone in this. You know, all of us are, are feeling that that wave of pressure there. But one of my favorite articles I read, um, it's about a teacher's portal that the country of Bangladesh has created, this teacher's portal. Mm -hmm. And teachers use it more than they use Google. So wow. Google is really what, um, you know, teachers in America, from the research I've read, it's like 92% of teachers use each other or mm -hmm. Google, right? Those yeah. are kind of two options. And we trust each other the most because we're all kind of in the same boat. But then we also like to just do a simple Google search. But the country of Bangladesh has a teacher's portal that teachers use more than Google because teachers can all share their content on this site. Um, they can upload any original resource they make, like a multimedia um, video. And I think if I just spend an hour doing that for my classroom, how much that could help every other sixth grade teacher yeah. in the country doing the same standards, you know, similar type of work. But um, you know, maybe I share that and I share a couple websites that I go to for extra support or free worksheets. And um, maybe a, a book I read, you know, if I read um, Dr. Jody Carrington's new book, right, yeah. like these days. So I can post that on there and I can share what I'm doing, even though that's my little world that I'm doing. 
well, what's everybody else doing? And then now we're all aware of those same resources. So um, the teachers in that country use this teacher portal for all of their resources and their downloads and their, and their lessons and their sharing in, at such a tremendous level. Yeah. It's, it's 89% of their teachers actually use their website for what they're, um, what they're going to teach in their classroom. And they find that kids are more engaged when they're using more multimedia of materials. So. I love that. That's so cool. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, what I what I think about as you talk and, and a question that I ask in every one of my tell your stories is, you know, mm -hmm. you've, you're involved in a lot of different things and, and a lot of different leadership type positions as well, whether that's with elementary blueprint or your doctorate or, or any of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so I know, especially when we start putting ourselves in those leadership positions and, and start sharing things with others sometimes this fear of comparison or doubt can creep in too where it's like oh my gosh do i even know what i'm talking about like these other people are doing it so much better or whatever so how do you personally keep doubt at bay so it doesn't take root in your own life yeah i think i'd be lying if i said it doesn't creep up daily you know with all of the with everything you can see on social media you can you it there's a constant um you know, there, there's a constant comparison out there every day that you that you could you could take that route, but I think that route kind of takes you down a dark path. Um, I read a quote once. It said, um, "Comparison is the death of joy," and it, it's so true. I, I think the best thing you can do to not feel that is to to focus on yourself, focus on what you can control. You know, I can control right. that I can get up and um, and take care of myself for a half hour, an hour, and then put put the rest of the day into my children, into the students, into my family, um, and, to, and to share what I know just to help other people, you know, however right. far that puddle goes, um, or however far that ripple effect goes, you know? Right. Um, so just being able to take care of yourself in order, in order to serve others is a, is a big piece of that. And comparing, I, I think people do it, and I, I think you can get trapped there, but if you realize that all you can do is present your best self and be better every day, then you're going to help serve right. with the gifts that you've been given. One of one of my things with Elementary Blueprint is I love to organize. So I'll have teachers come into my room sometimes and say, I'll pay you just to organize my files. You know, and I've had that before and I, I want to help them in a way more so digitally now because that's yeah. our new world. Um, I, I, it's like a secondary gift, you know, and if I can do that in any way to help be that umbrella of all the resources that are out there, that's what I want to give back to education. So, so what's your ultimate goal with this elementary blueprint? My ultimate goal is to, to mirror the way that the, the teachers in Bangladesh use the teacher's portal. My goal is that, um, you, you know, we, we don't just need people to follow on social media at Elementary Blueprint. We need people to get in there and start adding resources and sharing what they've created. Like if I do a battle of the books in my class and I have a whole PowerPoint for our top um, 16 books that we're going to battle out uh -huh. in March, I can share that, right? I've created it. It's original content. You know, you can't upload something that has been produced by another developer or anything. Um, or I could share the website that, you know, I use Read, Write, Think a lot in my classroom just because they have so many great interactives. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I, I link that and it bounces you to their site. So these people that are all producing great things, these silos, we call them everywhere in education, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to bring them all together. So, you know, a teacher that changes a grade level or a subject area, which happens all the time, you know, they're not starting from square one all right. the time. You know, I love that. that and and that, that's such a cool goal. And, and you've already got a great um, blueprint to look at when, when you're looking at what's been done overseas. And so there's some great work to start there. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see where this heads. And so, you know, going back to you, Kelly, when you look at your own life, who's somebody that's been really instrumental in your own path? Oh, wow. That's a good question. There's and so I know there's lots of people. Yeah. Who say, this is not meant to yeah. upset anyone that you didn't mention them. <laughs> I mean, there's certainly um, specific teachers that I had a teacher named Mrs. Good. Um, <laughs> that was her real name. <laughs> she was my fifth grade teacher. And what's, what's funny is I actually wanted in fifth grade, we had the opportunity. It was our first male teacher. His name was Mr. Patterson. Everybody wanted to be in his class because I think they thought it was cool to have a male teacher yeah. for once, you know, and um, I ended up with Mrs. Good and, and what turned out to just be like, you know, a very child childish disappointment. She was my favorite teacher 
of all time. Right. You know, she offered choice in all the learning she did. She was incredibly positive. I still remember her smile. I remember when we did the move update to middle school and she came and, oh. and talked to me and, and just checked in to see how it was going. And um, I, re I remember a high school English teacher named Miss Raver too, who gave us choice in all of our assignments. You know, we could show that we understood the literature we were reading by, um, by finding song lyrics that matched the book and defending how those song lyrics, lyrics represented a character. Um, so those are the people that teachers wise, um, but in my, in my personal life, my grandmother is 94 and she's a true inspiration because she's the lifelong learner. She still right. has an iPad. She emails me weekly, <laughs> kept up with technology, which is incredible to be able to do that your whole life. And yeah. um, she just has that attitude of like, I'm never going to give up. I'm just going to keep learning what's out there and, and do my best. And I think that's a real inspiration in my life because you don't have an excuse then, you know, if you're not exactly. like, oh, grandma's keeping up with it, you can't, you can't turn it off and just be satisfied with the status quo. You know, you have to. Get it. So I love that. Yeah. If, if 94 year old grandma can get in there and try to learn it, like I better be getting up off my butt and try to learn it too. I love that. Exactly. There's no excuse to give up. Then. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Kelly, one way that I always love to wrap up these conversations is I believe as people, there are certain things that we hold true to ourselves or the foundation of who we are and, and they just run through everything. And so for the people who are listening and watching today, if there's one thing they were to walk away with from this conversation, what would your one thing be for them? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> My, uh, I would say um, you want to be as authentic. If you can find your authentic self, you know, which I've put a lot of time and energy into figuring out who I am and what gifts I have that I can actually share with the world. Um, for me, I think it's being kind. It's sharing what I know. Um, it's it's being honest and, and just putting myself out there more. Um, I would like I would like to teach others to do that as well. The more you can figure out and spend some time really figuring out who you are and what gifts you have to share with the world, the happier you'll be personally. And you know, you never know who that will impact or who exactly. that will reach. Um, so I, I think that would be where I am in my life right now. You know, just trying to put all the gifts together that I've been given to to share out with the world. I love that. Well, Kelly, I was so excited to get to chat with you today, and I can't wait to see where Education Blueprint ends up. And so thank you so much for spending some time on Tell Your Story this morning. Thanks for your time, Todd. And thank you, everybody, for listening or watching another episode of Tell Your Story. Remember, you can check out past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever you get your stuff. It's there. I hope today's conversation with Kelly has encouraged you to get out there and tell your story because every story matters.